Hello Year 12, this is Mrs Oates speaking to you. Um, first of all, thank you very much for choosing to do the English language induction session. Obviously, it would be lovely if we were able to do it face to face and work in groups, but we shall do our best um, with our distance home learning. Um, first of all, I always like to start the session with this quotation. It is impossible for an Englishman to open his mouth without making some other Englishman hate or despise him. And that's a quotation from George Bernard Shaw. So have a little think about that quotation and consider how far you agree with that quotation or how far you disagree with that quotation. Do some people speak and their very voice or the words that they say um, irritate you or annoy you? Um, is there something particular about English men or women and the way that they speak that may irritate or annoy you? So we're going to start off by looking at something called a corpus. Now a corpus just means a collection of data and that data could be anything it could be text messages tweets um, extracts from novels headlines from newspapers just a collection of various types of the same thing so we're going to have a look at a corpus of some tweets that have come from twitter and these ones were selected because as it says here they received more than 50,000 retweets in 2018. So we're going to think about why they have been retweeted. Now in the folder, there's a Word document with all the resources on. And I've just snipped this bit here to show you um, that this is the corpus you should be looking at for this activity. So you have one, two, three, four, five tweets. And as I said, these were retweeted the most in 2018. I've typed them exactly as they appeared in the tweet. So the spelling and the punctuation and the grammar are as they would have been in the tweets themselves. And that's really important because changes and variations in how people um, type and write and speak is something we're really going to study in a lot of depth in the coming year. So I'd like you to read all of these tweets through first. Try and make sense of what they're saying. Some of them you might not completely understand. But have a look through them and see what you make of them. Are they meant to be humorous? Are they meant to be sarcastic? And I have included the um, knowledge organisers for you as well. So I'd also like you to spend about 15 minutes labelling any features that you notice here. So, for example, if on the knowledge organiser, it says something like a elision. Can you see an example of an elision in here? If, for example, on the knowledge organiser, it says um, initialism and you read that definition and you think, ah, there's an initialism here. Label that as well. These are your new glossaries of terminology that will be the bread and butter of the course. So as I said, take about 15 minutes um, before you move on um, or pause the slideshow and have a look through that first of all. OK, so the main chunk of the session today focuses on Love Island, which is a really popular television show. But it's also a really interesting television show to analyse when we think about the sociolect of the contestants on the programme. And on your knowledge organiser, you'll have a definition for sociolect. And it essentially means language, so words um, and phrases that are specific to a particular social group. Now on Love Island, they're in a social group, um, sort of by force, obviously they've chosen to go on the show, but they're stuck with the same people for the amount of time that they're in the villa and so a sociolect, a shared way of speaking, um, is developed and it strengthens as time goes on. And this was good old Tommy here. Um, 
think he was talking about Molly potentially here, saying that it just refreshifies my memory. So he's created his own verb there, refreshifies. Um, and we're going to think about whether that's creative or catastrophic. So if somebody creates a new word, coins a new word, is that acceptable? Okay. Or is it a negative thing? Can anybody create new words or should it be a certain set of people? And this is an argument that's going to run through the whole course. Should the English language stay one particular way and follow set rules and standards? Or should it be more flexible and allow this creativity? And here's just um, some other examples, actually, of coined words and neologisms, words that have been created for a variety of reasons. So something like vape, so to vape, um, that verb needed to be created because as um, health experts made the public more aware that smoking tobacco is obviously very bad for your health, companies created an alternative slightly better um, addictive substance and they needed a new word for that invention so they came up with um, the vape is it a machine <laughs> and people talk about vape and vaping and then we have something like labradoodle this is what we call a blend word so you take labrador and a poodle and you blend those words together and take some letters from one and some letters from the other. And again, as people breed different dogs, um, if it's a 50-50, I suppose here, I don't know much about the kind of breeding process, but they're calling it a Labradoodle to let people know whether it's half Labrador, half Poodle. So again, is that quite harmless? Is it quite sensible? They need to call this new breed of dog something. Or does it get a bit silly? Jeggings the gene legging. Does that make you kind of cringe when you hear that one? Something to think about. So the next activity, which is also on the Word document, is the part of the Word document that looks like this over here. I've selected um, a clip from Love Island. It's kind of a highlights clip. I think it's about three to four minutes long. And it just goes through some of the slang, and that's one of the key terms on your knowledge organiser. So it goes through some of the slang that appears in various um, seasons of Love Island. So if you watch it through, you might want to watch it through twice um, and then just note down or type if you're working on a um, computer. The examples of the contestants so select that you hear and see on the YouTube clip. And it's quite interesting because the clip's called something like um, Love Island Translated for Americans. And that should get you thinking as well, because clearly Love Island is being um, transmitted, no broadcast in America. And there's a need to actually offer some kind of um, translations of the Love Island sociolect, because those words and phrases don't naturally appear in the American national way of speaking. So that's quite interesting as well. Um, so yeah, note this down in the box here, and then afterwards, I said thinking about the tweets, so the tweets from activity one, and the examples of slang that you've just taken from Love Island, how would you summarise what is being revealed about language use in the 21st century? So you can use opinion here. Do you think the changes that you're observing are a positive thing or a negative thing? You can talk about both sides of that argument. What specifically do these changes reveal about society? Are there any attitudes towards men or women or love and romance that seem to be changing from the traditional view? Um, are any of the terms in those tweets um, there simply because of a change in trend or fashion or technology? Those are the kind of factors that force language to change and adapt. So those are the ones I want you to think about. That's probably going to take you another 15 minutes because you need to look back through your notes from Love Island and the tweets from the previous activity and just you can fill in the lines here 
um, or do it on a separate document if it's you know going to take a bit more room. Um, so if you've made it this far, <laughs> well done, fantastic. This is a little reflection activity. This particular session has focused on the language use in social groups that people have chosen consciously to be in. So if you are on Love Island, you've applied or your agent has applied on your behalf, you've chosen to be there. Um, the tweets, we have some examples of people who are tweeting um, from their own accounts. They're presenting their own identity forward. They've chosen to go on their own tweets. But actually, we're all part of other groups that we might not have consciously chosen to be a part of, what we call a wider social class. So the question in red on the bottom here um, asks, what would you say determines which social class people exist in? So which factors that are kind of out of our control decide the classes that we're placed in. So we take about five minutes just to kind of list some ideas or mind map them, which factors. So these are just some suggestions um, of things that you might have thought of. So household income, so the money that your parent or parents or carers uh, make might determine the social class that you're in. And obviously that's out of your control. Whether you own a property or rent it. Um, again, obviously at this point in your lives, I guess it's unlikely that you're um, renting or owning property or if you are, well done. But again, whether your parents own a house yet or are renting impacts the social class they might be in. The postcode area that you live in. So there are certain postcodes that are more, um, that are more affluent and that might reveal something about you or people might have prejudices against particular postcodes. Streets, roads, you might know these yourself in Saltash and Plymouth. Um, people make judgments when you say you're from a particular area. The amount of savings, or debt that you have to your name, types of educational qualifications that you hold, or whether your parents attended university or not. It does tend to be a trend that if your family have been to university before you, you will then go. I have to say that's not the case for me. I didn't have family members that had been before and then I did go. Um, so it's not a rule, but it's typicality, it's a trend. So these are all things that might be out of your control but they determine which social class you exist in or um, kind of function in. And when you're analysing texts in English language, we usually always come back to these um, factors or determiners to explain why somebody has said a particular thing in a particular way, um, why somebody might have a particular attitude um, that they're expressing in a text. We always come back to these factors. So just to finish off, um, in the folder as well, there is um, your summer work. So it is the spoken language glossary of all the terminology. Some of these things you'll have heard of before. So possibly something like register you'll have heard before or formality. You might have talked about in English language when you're analysing text at GCSE. Um, but then there'll be new things in there you haven't talked about before, idiolect and sociolect and back-channeling and fillers. And this is really what's great about English language. It is brand new. It's so different to GCSE. So whether you did really well at GCSE or whether you perhaps weren't the strongest, but you just enjoy the subject, it's just a fresh starting point for everybody. And then there's also the standard and non-standard English knowledge organiser. 
This is currently split into weeks, um, and that's because when you return in September, you're set um, weekly homeworks based on the knowledge organiser. Um, and this is to help you to organise revising, organise doing wider reading for the subject. But don't worry about the weeks too much now, just go through those terms and definitions. And you don't need to do the wider reading now. Um, uh, you couldn't anyway because I haven't provided that. But that's just those. And then I just put a few little hints on the sheet as well for kind of revision strategies that you might like to use. Obviously, I'm sure, based on all the work the school has done over the past couple of years, that actually you're going to be absolute pros at knowing your revision strategies and which ones work the best for you. I've just listed a few here just to help you out. Um, I popped my email onto the Word document at the top in the header. So it's sotes at saltashcloud.net. Please don't feel like you're a bother or a burden if you have a question about the work or if you have a question about the course more generally. Um, I haven't gone too much into kind of the um, admin of the course, kind of what things are worth, what exams are worth, um, because I feel like that's quite dry, black and white information that can be given to you on a sheet when you come in in September. What I wanted this session to really be is this is what a lesson might look like and then you can really kind of cement or confirm if it's the right subject for you. Um, so yeah, so drop me an email if you have any questions about anything. And yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this induction session and hopefully see you soon. Bye.